You know, first of all, I think at a fundamental level, what I love about what you just shared is so many people jump into selling and sales and they don't really understand what good selling and sales is, right? Like good selling and sales is about creating opportunities for other people to thrive through what you do and making them aware of that. But it's very them focused. It's not you focused. And that, you know, it sounds to me like that's what you kind of learned along that journey, right? As you pivoted your approach to that. Welcome, Model FAs. I am very excited to bring our guest to you today. Have had a couple of good back-to-back recordings today. So having a great day myself. Hopefully you will get some value out of this episode. And we are here with Aaron Klein. Aaron is a co-founder of Riskalyze. Riskalyze was founded in 2011 and he helped grow the company to serve tens of thousands of financial advisors and twice being named as one of the world's top 10 most innovative companies in finance by Fast Company Magazine. He also co-founded Hope Takes Root, an initiative to serve orphans and vulnerable kids in Ethiopia and serves on the board of Invest in Others, an organization that supports financial advisors who give back to their communities. Investment News has honored him as one of the industry's top 40 under 40 executives. I am humbled and grateful to be with you today, Aaron, and I welcome you to the show. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me and uh, really grateful for the invitation. Excited to be here. Love it. So let's go through a little bit about your backstory. So if I'm not mistaken, your initial strategy back in 2011 till I'm not sure when was more of a B to C strategy. If I'm not mistaken, you quickly realized that kind of tough to go B to C and you weren't finding a ton of success as you had hoped at that point in the business. And you had decided to pivot more towards the B to B space. And as a result, you guys have you know 30,000 plus users on the platform now. So to say it was a successful pivot, I think would be an understatement. But tell me a little bit about that journey and realization that you had during that time period. Yeah, for sure. So, you know, Riskalyze is a company that actually started as a conversation between friends. I was, you know, running global product for a division of an options brokerage firm. My co-founder, Mike McDaniel, was a financial advisor. And so, you know, I'm leading technology teams that are building tools to help options traders figure out risk. And I remember saying to him, it is crazy how the average individual thinks about the concept of risk. And he said, if you think that's crazy, you should see how many of us financial advisors think about it. You know, we just really haven't had the tools in our profession to understand who our clients are and really align that with the risk in their portfolios. And so, you know, when we double clicked on that idea, we really, you know, kind of realized that the industry had gotten kind of reliant on these qualitative terms like conservative, moderate, and aggressive. And, you know, the real problem is, is that we're not really sure if everybody means the same thing by these words, right? And so, you know, I, I, you can imagine like if contractors and architects talk to each other, they'd be like, don't forget, they want to, you know, a moderately conservative hallway leading to their moderately aggressive conference room. And like the building would not come together, right? So we really felt like we needed to put the feet and inches into this process for financial advisors. And that's, you know, a big part of how the risk number was born. But when we started in 2011, one of the things that we kind of said was great financial advisors are not going to road test brand new risk technology on their clients. So the first thing we've got to do is we've got to validate this. And our thought process was kind of interesting. And, you know, to be honest, as, as much as this strategy didn't fully work, I look back and I go, I'm not sure that we would have gotten to where we are if we hadn't have followed this part of the journey, you know? But what we did is we we built it as a free website focused on kind of $25,000 E-Trade guys, right? Like that was kind of the prototypical customer we had in mind for the first version of this free on the web. And, you know, it, effectively that part of it was very successful in that we got some PR in like the New York Times and Barron's and NPR radio. We had users come in and build $2 billion in portfolios on the platform. So we had a lot of engagement from people who loved capturing their risk number and then, you know, plugging in their portfolio and kind of seeing how the alignment happened and like coming back and like rechecking that from time to time. And so there was, there was a lot of engagement from users there. And, you know, that $2 billion, it was like $27,000 average account size. So we definitely had like struck a chord with consumers in a way, you know, that was really interesting. Our strategy though, to make money off of this, 
this was to license that technology, you know, once we kind of proved it out to one of the big five discount brokers at the time, right? And say, we, we kind of had some projections for how much money we thought we could make off that. We weren't going to, you know, we, we weren't going to be wildly successful with that money, but we planned on using that money to sustain the company in investing in the advisor product that we really wanted to build. Right. And so, you know, I'm crisscrossing the country in 2012 trying to put a deal together with one of these five discount brokers. And it didn't, it was not going well. Like within short order, like three of the five just dropped out, you know, and they're like, we just don't use third party partners to do technology for our retail platforms. And then, you know, like e trade wanted to do the deal, but they were kind of a financial basket case in 2011. And so they actually lost their CEO again that year. So, you know, it just wasn't coming together. And then, you know, uh, TD. Ameritrade actually really wanted the deal to happen. Uh, but they had some technical hurdles at the last minute. And so that, you know, kind of fell apart. And so here we are like Labor Day of 2012. And I am flying back home from a meeting with TD Ameritrade where the deal has like fallen apart. And I'm like, we've got three months of money left in the bank. Somewhere I've still got the page, you know, the notebook where I, I flipped it up into a new page, you know, and I'm sitting there going, I wrote what I call the Apollo 13 question at the top of that page, right? Which is where Gene Krantz says, what do we have on the ship that's good, you know, like what are our assets here that we can work the problem with, you know? And all I could really write on that page was great core risk methodology, you know, and technology and $2 billion of validation. And so, you know, I came home, kind of got the team together on Labor Day weekend. And I'm like, you know, guys, we've got three months of money left in the bank. Like if we're going to go down, let's go down swinging. Let's rebuild the product for financial advisors now. And let's see if the $2 billion of validation is enough to get great financial advisors to use the product. And, you know, lo and behold, that worked and our investors stood behind us. And March of 2013 is when that came out of beta. And it just kind of, you know, went like a rocket ship from there. And it's been a wild ride ever since. I love that. I'm curious to know, because I've found or seen this in myself on a number of occasions, and I would imagine everyone listening to this has dealt with this as well, which is doubt seeping in throughout your entrepreneurial journey. So you go and, you know, you get shut down in all these meetings, you're spending money oh, yeah. to, you know, actually fly out there and stay out there. You know, what were some of the things that you did with your mindset along that journey to stay positive, persevere and continue to move forward, even with those, I won't call them failures, I'll call them learning opportunities along the way. Honestly, like they are, are kind of micro failures along the way, right? But they are learning opportunities. And part of it is the mindset of keeping in mind that this is a process of learning. Like a startup is a process of learning a bunch of things that hopefully lead you on a path to a business, right? And, and I mean, that that's literally what a startup is. And so, you know, I would just say this, one of the first things you kind of have to figure out is, are you way off or are you a little bit off? You know, like if things are not working out, how far off do you think you are? One of the core principles that I tried to follow, and it's really difficult because it's difficult to have perspective. I had good friends of mine who were very supportive people who were like, eh, like maybe this is just effectively they were saying, maybe you're far off, you know, like maybe you're just pointed in the wrong direction. But I tried to follow the principle, you know, of like taking the red pill, right? Like that the concept from the matrix of like, let's choose reality over, you know, telling mm -hmm. ourselves what we want to hear and really tried to listen listen carefully about what was working and how far off we were because we were clearly off, right? Like the initial strategy was not working, but there were parts of it that were clearly right. Like all that engagement from users told us that there was a hunger for quantifying things about how you're invested and figuring out who you are and matching that up with how you invest. And so there were a lot of good signals that were telling us that we weren't far off. We were just a few degrees off. And at the end of the day, if you're just a few degrees off, like the startups that fail are when people quit. Like the question is how much tenacity, how much, how much drive do you have to, to be willing to extend your learning experience long enough to like figure it out and get to the other side. And we got very fortunate, you know, between, you know, smart people that were willing to be kind to me and give me advice and give me perspective. Right. And a combination of that and great, you know, co-founders and people in the company at the beginning. And we could talk through issues and think through things and try to figure out, you know, which degrees we should turn to try to sail 
sail the ship in the right direction and kind of reach, you know, where we were trying to go. You know, that combination of things came together and for us allowed us to get to the other side. And that's, you know, that's a hard journey. It takes, there's a reason why entrepreneur is such an incredible title is because, man, it's a calling and it takes a long time sometimes of kind of wandering out there and sailing into the vast unknown and you can't see land and you don't know if you're missing land by three degrees or 180 degrees. You just don't know. And that's the difficulty and also the wonder that is being an entrepreneur and going through that process of being a startup and, you know, finally learning enough that it becomes a business. Love it. So if I'm tracking you, it's a matter of having the right people on the team that are tenacious while also supportive and then being open to feedback. Maybe from some folks, you take it a little bit more with a grain of salt than others if they don't see the vision as much as you. I remember when I left being a financial advisor and got into the consulting space, you know, my, a lot of members of my family, you know, family wants the best for you. Hopefully anyways, they want the best for you. And especially my parents, their job is to protect you. And there was not, it wasn't that they were casting doubt, but they were like, what are you doing? You have a good thing going. I mean, I kind of use that as fuel, but you know, taking people's feedback so you can redirect and having that support system around you is kind of what I'm hearing from you. Well, and taking the red pill means that you're hearing their feedback and you're asking yourself lots of questions like, you know, first of all, do they know something about the market that I don't? Well, when it's your parents, God bless them, you're right. They're there to protect you, right? They're there to and and I would I would just say, you know, I drive around with the risk 99 license plate on my car, but when it comes to my kids, my risk number is a lot lower than that. So I'm I, I'm going to do my best to be a supportive parent of their dreams, but I'm quite confident there's going to be times where I'm going to be sitting there going, oh, are you sure you know what you're doing? Like you've got a good thing going. Are you sure you want to take that leap? And, you know, that's a natural thing, I think, for kids to do with parents. I think, you know, again, if you're going to be an entrepreneur, you have to take that into account. And I had to look, for example, at some of those friends who were casting some doubt and go, okay, do they know something about the market that I don't? You know, turned out they, they knew something about software businesses and startups. They didn't necessarily really know anything about this industry and this particular market and the market that we were trying to serve. And, you know, I, I remember one of those friends, for example, after the first, you know, hundred advisors had joined Riskalyze and he was just kind of like, yeah, a hundred customers. Like I've seen startups fail at a hundred customers. Just be careful before you overextend yourself. Like he wasn't trying to be negative. He was just, he wanted the best for me. Right. And just be careful before you overextend yourself. And I, I just remember that conversation mm-hmm. and going, I hear that, right. but I know enough about this profession and I'm hearing enough input from people here to know that this is that if you can get a hundred people, a hundred financial advisors to take a risk with their clients, right? The most precious thing that they safeguard to leverage your technology to serve them better. And the feedback is you help me serve my client better. That is something where it's going to have legs. And that was, you know, yeah, you got to listen to the right signals when you're, when you're an entrepreneur, it's pretty critical. Love it. So I have a belief and I'm curious to get a sense as to what you do. So my belief is that in the entrepreneurial journey, there's ups and downs and ebbs and flows and you're challenged constantly throughout the process. Your your resiliency is challenged. And I feel like you also get a lot of warning shots along the way that help you redirect. And I think that it's important to have a certain aspect of your life that is foundational and stable. And for me, that's my personal routine that I know that if crap hits the fan, I can go back to that. So I'm curious to know what your personal routine looks like, like your self-care routine, so to speak. Um, outside of yep. outside of business that keeps you on track? Yeah, that's an interesting question. I would say that it's gotten a little bit more intentional in more recent years than frankly it was before. I mean, I can remember in the early days, I would just kind of live and breathe and, you know, just riskalize like every, every moment of every day. It's still pretty all encompassing, but, you know, I uh, can say in those early days, I didn't have much of that kind of routine. So if I was not living and breathing and thinking riskalize, I was probably spending time with my wife and kids like that. That was, those are the two things I was doing. That was it, you know? So, you know, I definitely learned along the way, you know, we've gone through lots of ups and downs. Definitely. I mean, feel really yeah. grateful, more ups than downs, right. But have gone yeah. through both kinds at all different stages of this company. And, you know, so I, a few things that I've learned and, you know, some of these are self-care. Some of these are just what I need to do to be yeah. invested in my family. I care a lot about my family 
family. My wife and I have three kids, you know, they're 17, 14, and 12. And, you know, the company has been around for 10 years. So you can do the math, like time goes by in a flash, right? And so I, you know, 10 years from now, they're all going to be out of the house. So I don't have, you know, the luxury of just going, well, no, I'm just going to keep focusing on this and I'll focus on you guys later, right? Like I want to be the kind of dad who is intentional about, about being there for his kids. And right. my wife and I have been married now for 20 years and, you know, we're each other's best friend. And so like, that's important and you've got to take time and invest in that. So what, what have I done? How have I reworked kind of routine to make that happen? One thing is that this did not come natural to me, but I turned into an early bird, an early person, right? So the alarm on weekdays, the alarm goes off for me at 4.45 in the morning. That is hard for me. Like I, I, I kind of like crawl out there and make the coffee and, uh, and try to start waking up at 4.45. It's not a natural thing, but I then take about an hour, you know, probably until about 6 AM to generally read, yeah. you know, and just think. And, you know, some days I'm reading, some days I'm, I'm writing. I've started, there are some days where it's just like, I can't even focus on reading because I've got too much swirling around in my head. And I'll just pull out a notebook and just start writing and just getting it down on paper and, and processing all those thoughts. And I end up getting a lot of clarity on that. I, I also, one of the things I did recently, I'm generally pretty self-controlled. So at first I thought that this was kind of silly, but it's just so helpful for muscle memory. I turned on Apple's uh, screen time for myself from like it basically does downtime on my phone and email doesn't work and all those different things don't work from like, I think I set it to like two in the morning, just in case I was working late one night, which is pretty rare, but like two in the morning to 6.30 right? And so I do that because if I get sucked into email or other kinds of issues, and I don't even know I'm doing it half the time, I can't tell you how many times I'm sitting there making coffee and I flip open my phone, I tap the email app and it pops up and says, this is this, you know, this app is on downtime right now. And I'm like, yeah, I don't do that right now. Right. But it's muscle memory. And so I've been using that as a tool to say, don't get sucked into that, like spend that hour reading and, you know, thinking through things. And it's given me a lot of clarity. So one of my always on apps is the to do list, because I do come up with a lot of things that I go, I need to do that. You know, I need to think about that problem. And then six to six 30, I'm usually like on the Peloton bike or doing something else, you know, working out and then, you know, shower change and leave for work and get into the office, you know, sometime in the seven o'clock hour, typically is when I try to do that seven 30 ish, something like that. And, and so what, why do I do that in the mornings? That's frankly, so that I can leave the office at six o'clock and have dinner with my family when I'm in town. If I don't get in early and do that, I cannot get home for dinner consistently when I'm not traveling. And so for me, I've just tried to make that paramount. We do that, you know, every evening that I'm in town. And then my wife and I, usually the kids uh, clean up dinner. Wow. It's just a great you got to figure it out. Started. <laughs> yes. Or maybe, or maybe it's she that has to figure that out. Oh, nice. Yeah. Yeah. We go out for a walk around the block and we just like process our day and talk about stuff and, and go out and like walk around the block for, you know, 30 minutes or something like that after dinner every night. And so that's kind of the routine that's worked really well for me. And then, you know, I, the other thing is that I, I absolutely, I probably work about yeah 58 to 62 hours a week. I find that anything above that, like my productivity is like dropping like a rock, you know? So I'll work some on Saturdays for sure. I don't, know how to do my job without, you know, spending some, some time catching up on Saturdays, but I really work to keep Sundays just work free. We go to church together and we spend Sunday, you know, quiet and trying to spend time with each other and, and try to keep it work free. Love it. Well, it's good to hear that I'm doing a lot of the same things that you're doing. One thing that I'm not doing that I'm going to need to figure out is the settings on your phone with the screen time. I didn't realize that was a thing, but I feel like that will help a lot with, you know, my phone, like I'll put it on silent, but if I look at my phone, I'll still right. see the notification. So right. I'll have to look in how to do that. So yeah, it's pretty cool. It's pretty cool. It's downtime under the screen time oh, settings. I'll check that out. Yeah. Awesome. So I read a, a book recently called What Great Sales People Do. And early on in my career, I was an advisor for seven years. And probably the first half of that, it was a sales-based culture. So it was like super salesy. I got in it when I was, you know, a hungry 20-year-old. And I alienated yep. a lot of people in my life <laughs> during that time because whenever I reached out, out to them, I either wanted their time, yep. their money, or their network. And it wasn't, I over rotated. And one thing that I haphazardly stumbled upon was rather than selling, I stumbled upon 
talking and, and selling through through storytelling, but I had no format about it. And what I really liked about this book is it brought you through how to actually construct a story, be it for a stage talk or be it for you know a sales conversation, mm-hmm. what have you. And what I've liked yeah. about this conversation so far is every time I've asked a question, you've had some sort of story format yep. throughout each of your responses. And I know you have a stage talk and you know that it really hits on storytelling specifically it's called unlocking the secrets of powerful storytelling so i don't i know we don't have enough time to go through everything that you talk about mm-hmm. on stage but i'm curious to know how you view storytelling and i'll leave it at that and let you take it as you please yeah sure so you know first of all i think at a fundamental level what i love about what you just shared is so many people jump into selling and sales and they don't really understand what good selling and sales is, right? Like good selling and sales is about creating opportunities for other people to thrive through what you do and making them aware of that. But it's very them focused. It's not you focused. And that, you know, it sounds to me like that's what you kind of learned along that journey, right? As you pivoted your approach to that. So I will say that I think that the storytelling approach to things will not work if you build it on top of a bad foundation that selling is about, you know, basically exploiting everybody's time, money and network for yourself right? It's, it's, it's still not going to work, right? But storytelling is a really powerful and, you know, construct to think about because, you know, I really believe that everything that we do is around creating the opportunities for others to thrive through what we provide and what we do and the value that we deliver to the world. And so the question is, is how do we effectively communicate that? Because a lot of us slip into a bad pattern of how we communicate that. And it's a very simple pattern. Okay. I'm the hero and I'm here to save the day. Right. And so the book that I read that started me thinking down these lines as well is there's a couple of books that I read, but probably the most powerful one was Story Brand, uh, which is by Donald Miller. And it sounds like it's similar concepts to what great salespeople do. But, you know, basically what he points out is that, you know, every great movie kind of follows a very similar pattern. And, you know, effectively, you know, there's somebody who has a problem, they have a challenge that they need to address. And then, you know, a guide comes onto the scene and kind of helps them solve the problem. Okay, or defeat the enemy or or whatever they've got to do in that particular story, right? And and kind of get to the other side of success. And the point is, is that that person who's there at the beginning, that's the hero of the story. The guide is not the hero. The guide comes onto the scene and helps the hero, you know, solve the problem and get to the other side. So, you know, let's apply this to Star Wars, one of the greatest movies of all time, right? Like Luke Skywalker is the hero of that story. You know, Obi-Wan Kenobi is not the hero of the story. He's the guide. And Luke has to decide whether he's going to follow the guide's advice and ultimately you know, manages to kind of win the day and destroy the Death Star, right? But that formula exists in a lot of different ways. And so now let's take it down. Let's apply the core idea to financial advisors. Oh boy, is that true with financial advisors? Financial advisors tend, you know, they're in a service business. They care deeply about doing the right thing for their clients. And they tend to very naturally fall into the hero role in the story. One of the reasons why that's true is because financial advisors, in my view, do very heroic work. Okay. It is not, you know, anything less than heroic to help average people figure out how to take their life's work and manage it towards creating wealth that allows their family and what they do to turn into their grandkids going to college or world changing nonprofit work through their generosity, or just the ability to retire with dignity and security and not be dependent upon others, right? Like these are great things that financial advisors enable and it's heroic work. So it's natural that they would kind of fall into the hero role in their communication, but it's critical that they make the client the hero. Because if you paint yourself as the hero, okay, instead of you as the financial advisor adopting the role of guide, okay, if you adopt the role of hero, guess what? That leaves your client as the spectator on the couch. They are watching your movie, they're eating popcorn, and every couple of minutes they're going, What has this movie done for me recently? Like, you know, and, and, and it's a it's a transactional relationship. Whereas the truth is you as a financial advisor cannot be successful unless the client plays an active role in the story. It's their short-term decisions that are going to feed the ultimate success of their financial plan that you're helping 
helping deliver for them, you need them engaged in the story. So if you don't position them as the hero of the story and you come in as the guide to help them get to the other side, they're not going to get there. And ultimately it's going to be a transactional relationship that doesn't really work out. I love that. I feel like there's a a lot to unpack in there that we don't necessarily have the time allotted to do so. My, my biggest takeaway is making sure that you as the advisor is not positioning yourself as the one who's saving the day and being the hero, but instead make sure the client feels and I'm putting words in your mouth. So let me know if I'm wrong. The client feels educated and empowered to make the decisions that they can save themselves from whatever the fill-in scenario is that they're currently in at that point in time. Yeah. Whether that's market volatility or whether that's, you know, high fees or whether that's whatever that is that they're dealing with that they want to solve that problem. You know, you being able to go to your client and say, listen, I'm really excited to work with you. I'm here to give you some guidance and some help on how we're going to navigate through this. But you know, you play a very important role in the story, right? Because I'll put it this way. I spoke to a large group of financial advisors once. I was super cruel. I said, how many people here help their clients make great long-term decisions? All the hands go up, right? Like every financial advisor, you know, is like, yes, I help my clients make great long-term decisions. I'm like, I'm terribly sorry. Trick question. None of your clients make long-term decisions. They only make short-term decisions, right? And the deal is, is that great short-term decisions are ultimately the fuel, the input that amazing financial advisors use to create those life transforming long-term financial outcomes, right? And so that's what this conversation is all about, is helping the client understand that they have a really important role to play. They have control over this situation. You're there as their guide to help them get to the other side and navigate through that. Hey, Model FAs. I know you're enjoying this conversation, but I wanted to take a quick break to talk to you about the Model FA Accelerator. This is a unique collaboration between us and you, where we help you build a financial advising practice that you can be proud of. We focus on the foundational concepts around how to pick a niche or a specialization how to price your services, how to construct an offer that people are going to buy, and then how to market it and sell it in a way that'll get people to sign on the dotted line and become clients of your firm. All while giving you the information to scale and set up workflows and operational processes that'll allow you to reclaim your time and build a practice that doesn't run you. So if you'd like to hear more about that, go to www.modelfa.com forward slash accelerator or www.modelfa.com hover over, work with us and click on Accelerator. Hope to see you in the program. So what I like about what you just said, love about what you just said actually is totally unrelated to that scenario. But you mentioned that clients make short-term decisions that serve as the fuel to that long-term vision that they have for themselves and their family. And I think there's a lot of power in that as it relates to a financial advisor specifically, meaning oftentimes you can get overly excited or overly bummed out as you look into the future to to your vision and what you need to do. And I mentioned this earlier on another podcast, but we put together this program called the C3 list. And what the C3 list is, the three C's are commitment, consistency, and confidence. And on that list is five things that you do every single day. And those five things are related to whatever your long-term vision is. And the five things are uh, two things that move you forward as a human human being. So it could be waking up at a certain time, working out, eating clean, reading, whatever. Two things that move your business forward every day. It could be reaching out to a certain amount of prospects or clients. It could be asking for introductions. It could be creating content. And then the last thing is something that moves someone else forward as small as, you know, holding the door open for that awkward amount of time to where they jog over to the door or, you know, random act of kindness, whatever it may be. And the whole idea there is really three main components. Number one is that Mm -hmm. oftentimes we can get overly excited or overly anxious about that larger goal. And we need to control the controllable and do the little things every single day that are in alignment with that larger vision. Second is that they're 100% in your control. It's not get a certain amount of referrals, it's ask a certain amount of times. And if Mm -hmm. you ultimately commit to that process and you're consistent with it, Confidence, I think anyways, comes or goes based on whether or not you keep little promises to yourself on a daily basis. So you're willing to put yourself in that uncomfortable situation and ask for an introduction because your confidence has risen. And all that time, you're getting one step closer brick by brick to whatever that larger vision is. That was my main takeaway as it relates to how to apply that to a financial advisor as well. 100%. Yep. I love that. 
When did you deliver or when did you create that C3 framework? That's really cool. I would say December or January. So December, 2020, January, 2021. And it was basically a culmination just to give credit where yeah. credit's due. It was a culmination of like a few different lists that were out there. There's the, a power list by Andy Frisella, the prize fighter day with Ben Newman. Yeah. Ben Newman was actually just recently on the podcast and it was my own spin on that to where, you know, when I was a financial advisor, there were days where I felt awesome and unstoppable. Yeah. And then there were days where I would feel off kilter. And it was usually because professionally I may have been making a bunch of money, but personally I was overweight and not being healthy or the opposite. I was doing great personally, but I wasn't making enough money. And I found that my happiness is derived from, is every aspect of my life moving in the right direction? And I quickly realized that in order to do that and and ensure that there's just a couple of things that you need to do on a daily basis to take the appropriate step and create that momentum for yourself. Well, and I'm curious, like how much of the fact that you're coming out of a global pandemic here influenced you to like, get that down on paper and and use that that way. Cause I found that I needed the routine and I needed, and then I had to find small ways to change the routine just to try to make it a little bit more interesting, you know, not massive material changes, just like, you know, good ways to like shake things up and make life feel a little bit, a little bit dynamic, you know, because 2020 was a hard year without that kind of routine. Yeah, I agree. And I would say previous to the pandemic, I was pretty fairly routined utilizing other people's lists. And then what I found was there was a lot of advisors who grew substantially during the pandemic because they just put their foot on the gas. And there were other advisors that, you know, figuratively speaking, hit under their desk and they need a little oomph. And that's, you know, where the C3 list came from, which is, hey, here, here's your oomph that, that you may need. Yeah. That's really great. That's awesome. Cool. Appreciate that. So to to transition, you know, one of my big passions within the industry is I feel like most advisors are good with their continuous learning. Some of them aren't, but most of which continuously learn. The challenge though, is that I find that a lot of them learn within the confines of our industry and and they, and they need to be. So I don't want to take away from that, but I feel like, I mean, even the two books that we discussed already, they're not our industry specific and there's a lot of great nuggets out there. So what I ask all of the guests on the show is what's a book. It could be your favorite right. book. It could be right. one of the books that had a big impact on you throughout your career. Yeah. What is that book and why did it have an impact on you? Uh, That's a great question. I try to read a lot because I've learned a lot of different things from reading books. One of which is that many books are not that great, (laughs) you know, but, but, and that's okay. Like I, I still feel like I, I, and what I mean by that is that a lot of books have one interesting core idea and it probably should have been a blog post, but you know, they had to staple 17 more chapters on to make it worth 1999, you know? So that's definitely true. I just, I don't know, from my perspective, like, I don't feel like that should take away from the ability to learn that great nugget, as you called it, right from that book. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's been a learning experience with reading. I used to get stuck where it's like, well, the reason I'm not reading right now is because I'm on this book and I'm on chapter three and it's a drag at this point. And I'm just stuck on that book. So I've started to learn like, Hey, look, if it's boring, just like, you know, start flipping through pages very, very quickly and see if it gets more interesting. And if you finish the book that way, like that's okay. You've learned something from that book, Mm -hmm. move on to the next one. You know, but there are some that are really interesting. And, and frankly, the books that I like the right. most are books that that are really kind of documenting how different companies or how different leaders or how different, you know, organizations did something rather than sitting in the in kind of the academic framework of like, here's an idea. And now let me prove to you the veracity of the mm-hmm. idea. OK, to be clear, there are some great books like Story Brand, like some of the stuff we've been talking about that are those more like I'm going to give you a framework and prove it and help you implement it. Those are interesting. Interesting. But, you know, like one of them that I absolutely really enjoyed just recently was Amazon Unbound, right? And that's, uh, I think the guy's name is Jeff Stone, who wrote that book. And it's basically just telling the story of like Amazon from shortly after IPO to today and how it's just grown into this, you know, mm. amazing company. And, you know, I, I recognize that sometimes it's a controversial company. You can like Amazon or hate Amazon and you can still look at it and go, it's wild what they they've been able to accomplish, right? And it's wild, the kind of innovation culture and the invention machine that Jeff Bezos created there. And I think that it's very interesting and very instructive to sit there and go, well, how did that come about? And great stories about how that 
actually happened in the real world are sometimes few and far in between. And Amazon Unbound has been a really interesting read to just like walk through some of those different pieces of like, how did they become a player in Hollywood? How did that even come about, right? How did the Prime, you know, free shipping program come about? How did Alexa come about? And how did they get all of this from within a company that basically was shipping toilet paper in a lot of different directions, right? You know, right. and and that's, it's, it's just a, it's a fascinating read to think about that. I, I've read a lot of books about Amazon by the way, there's another one that I recently read that I've distributed to a lot of leaders inside of our company called Working Backward. And that's a little bit more, there's still a lot of great stories about how they did it, but it's actually written by two former Amazon executives, one of whom was Jeff Bezos, chief of staff. And you know the level of specificity of how they use written narratives instead of PowerPoint and how they you know work backwards from how this impacts the customer. Again, a lot of these kind of core principles are things that we've, you know, that have been reflected inside Riskalyze, for example, for 10 years. But there's ways that they've implemented them that I looked at that and said, wow, that's powerful. We're going we're gonna to try that and see if that works inside of our organization. So those are two that I found really interesting recently, Amazon Unbound and Working Backward. Yes. There's a couple things that you mentioned that I want to hit on. So one is when you're reading a book like that, it's always nice when you read something about what a successful company did or is doing, and you're doing that too. And it serves as great confirmation that you're on the right track, you know, and then it's up to you if there's an idea that you have not implemented saying, okay, they may be doing something different, but how is that applicable to my business? So it requires some critical thinking. And then back to the beginning where you mentioned, you know, there's a lot of books out there that aren't like, oh my God, this was awesome, but there's still usually a nugget. And to me, that's worth, you know, the four or five hours that it takes to to read the book, unless you're a speed reader and can read it faster. And yeah. then when you think about what the alternative is, the alternative is you get lost in this device right here, yeah. or you're watching the TV show. Yeah. And for me during free time, I'd rather fill my brain with books and podcasts as opposed to social media and, you know, and TV shows and movies and stuff. And I still do that. Don't get me wrong, but a hell of a lot less than, you know, before I, you know, took up learning again over the last few years. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, you just have to look at the ROI of all of those different activities, right? Like social media has a strong, positive ROI for me. I engage in it a lot. I I learn a lot from customers. If you're engaging, if you're just sitting there consuming, like a lot of folks do, then it's like your brain. Absolutely. Absolutely. (laughs) I, but you know, like I get value out of learning what other people are saying on social Mm -hmm. media, but it has a law of diminishing returns. Exactly what you just said, right? Where, you know, there's, it has some value, but at some point you're really not learning and and you're just you're just kind of everybody saying the same thing to each other in an echo chamber and you've got to go you know challenge your brain in other ways so you know i would argue if all i did was read books and i was completely cut off from what the rest of the world thinks which is you know basically i consume that through social media that probably wouldn't be a super positive thing but on the other hand if i'm spending anywhere close to like equal time looking at what the rest of the world thinks versus trying to learn for myself, that's negative ROI for sure. I don't have a magical percentage, but like it's not equal time. I should be learning uh, a multiple of how much time I'm just hearing what the rest of the world thinks. Totally agree. So before we wrap up this portion of the show and head into the after hours, sure. if there happens to be an advisor that is yet to be using Riskalyze. There's a few. (laughs) There's definitely Definitely, definitely a few out there for sure. Well, hopefully they're listening to this episode. So with that being said, what's the best way to engage with you? What's the best way to engage with the company? Yeah, sure. Well, I mean, first of all, we love having the opportunity to serve financial advisors and we feel so grateful. I, you know, it was probably about, it was 2017 when we first hosted our customer conference, the Fearless Investing Summit, that we didn't know if anybody wanted to come to a conference for their risk alignment solution in 2017. I'll just be really honest, right? Like we booked a relatively small hotel and said, and it was in Lake Tahoe, like a 45 Hmm. minute drive from here. And we're like, we're like that way, if nobody wants wants to come, we'll go up there. We'll take 15 people up there and we'll just like, you know, hang out with the 50 customers who show up and we'll just call it a day. Right. And it was sold out and it was wild. And I mean, uh, when I walked in there with my couple of co-founders right. and we're just like, oh my gosh, like it struck us that Riskalyze has become more than a company. It's really like this fearless investing movement of financial 
advisors who believe that if you engage clients with risk, it transforms how you can communicate, how clients can understand and see the things you've been telling them for years. It transforms them from fearful investors who make bad short-term decisions into fearless investors who make great short-term decisions. And that's that movement is what drives us today. So, you know, if you're interested in engaging in that, obviously riskalyze.com is a great way to, to, to get started. You can email me if you're if you're curious, I can connect you with somebody great on our team. I'm AK at riskalyze.com. And I love talking with great financial advisors. And I am active on Twitter at Aaron Klein and uh, love doing that. A little bit less active on LinkedIn, but I'm on LinkedIn as well and, and love connecting with great financial advisors in, on any of those networks. Awesome. And based on when this recording will be released, it'll probably be end of August, yeah. um, you know, perhaps into September. So if you're listening to this, hope to see you yeah. in a month or so at the Risk Alive conference. Uh, Patrick Brewer and I will be there. Yes. So with that, with every episode, uh, before we head into the after hours portion here, if you found value in today, which I think you'd be hard pressed to not find value, go ahead and share this with another advisor that you think would also find value. And also in order to help increase visibility, get this in front of more folks, they can be impacted as well. We would love it if you would go onto iTunes and leave us a review. Hopefully it's a positive one. And when you do so, go ahead and screenshot that that review and shoot me a text with that screenshot and the word riskalyze so I know what episode this is in regards to and shoot me a text at 978 978- Two two eight two three three eight. Now, what will happen when you click send is you'll get an immediate reply, an automatic reply with a link for you to input your name, and that's just so you can get added to my contacts. And then beyond that, you're chatting with me, you know, back and forth. So it's not an automated platform or anything like that. And as a thank you for doing so, one of our managing partners at Model FA, Dan Allison, he has a referral methodology that he's been speaking on in our industry for the last eighteen years. And we got two videos. That's one of him presenting and another one that basically says, hey, now that you're excited about this, here's actually how you do it. And we got the scripts, we got the language, we got the process, we got all that type of stuff. So as a thank you for leaving a review, I will give you a login link for free to be able to go and consume that. So with that, we're going to head into the after hours portion. But for now, Aaron, I appreciate your time. I appreciate your energy. I think it'll be great to see you up on stage if you're this good on a podcast over a brief period of time. I'm excited to see you on stage. So uh, with that, thank you. And we'll head over to the after hours portion. Thanks, David. Thanks for having me. So typically we spend some time, you know, asking funny questions, you know, maybe sharing an embarrassing story or two. With that being said, I want to pull a little bit of an audible on that because I think we could actually, uh, not in a recorded fashion, but be able to crack some jokes and whatnot in person here later on this fall. So with that, I am very intrigued to hear a little bit more about hope takes root. Sure. And what got you into that? What it's all about? I always love to hear how people use their time, which is valuable and their wealth towards serving people that may never be able to reciprocate. I'd love to learn a little bit more about that. Sure. Absolutely. It's something I love talking about. And it's so fascinating because, you know, it's, I don't want to say that we totally like stumbled into it, but it's a series of small short-term decisions, right? That kind of led us there. And it it probably starts when we made the decision to adopt. We, My wife and I have adopted three times and, you know, candidly, we've never been diagnosed with the reason we can't have biological mm-hmm. kids. It just like didn't happen for us immediately. And then we kind of said, you know, my youngest sister was adopted, uh, was born in Romania. So we're very comfortable with, understood the process. We're like, maybe this is like our plan A, like maybe, maybe this is what we're supposed to do. And so, so anyway, we decided to do that. And, you know, to, to try to make a long story short, my, uh, my first son is our 14 year old and he was born in South Korea and in South Korea, adoption is kind of international adoption is driven for cultural reasons. It's kind of a patriarchal society. So like bloodline comes through the man. So if you're the daughter of a single mother, eventually you'll get married and kind of that will be erased. 
But if you're the son of a single mother, they don't even give you your mom's last name and you kind of have no bloodline. Oh, wow. So you might not even get married. Like your your future father-in-law would kind of go, but I don't know who you are. I don't know what your family is, you know? And so, yeah, it's it's really kind of interesting. There, there, you know, there's a lot, Korea is trying to change that in some different ways, but that's kind of what's there culturally. And so that's, you know, that drives a lot of Korea's international adoption. So we adopt our son. He's eight months old when he comes home. He's an amazing kid. He's He's really awesome. You know, a couple of years later, we go back to adopt again and Korea has ballooned up to like a three year wait. And we're kind of like, well, that kind of tells us that there's not as much need there right now. So our adoption agency had just started working in Ethiopia. Right. right? And so we're like, OK, well, maybe we'll you know, so we applied to the Ethiopia program. Now in Ethiopia, international adoption is driven by like bone crushing poverty right? It's a rich country in terms of its culture. It is the fastest growing economy in Africa today. So it's it's actually in a bit of a renaissance and it's it's really exciting to see. And we're trying to surf some of that to drive more prosperity into that country with what we're doing with Hope Takes Root. But initially we're just adopting our daughter, right? And we fly to Ethiopia to like bring her home. She's also eight months old when she comes home, but it is a life-changing experience to travel in Ethiopia and, and just kind of see things that you just hadn't really seen. We think we have people, I, this is a little bit politically incorrect to say, but like, we think we have poor people in the United States. Like, I don't want to denigrate anybody's experience in the United States who struggles through things, but like our poor people often have smartphones in the United States. Okay. Like you have not seen poverty until you've gone to sub-Saharan Africa and seen like truly desperate situations that are just so hard to see. And so that was life-changing for us. And so we decided at that point in time, we started thinking and writing and reading and talking to people and going like, how do we make an impact? It's not just adoption. International adoption is great, but like the solution to Ethiopian poverty is not for us to adopt all of their kids and bring them here, right? Like that's not the solution to poverty. It's the solution for that kid. But how do we think holistically about that and kind of try to solve that problem sustainably? And we got involved in a school project in the South of Ethiopia. It was about 200 kids when we first saw it. We were really grateful to become a part of that and raise money to build more classroom buildings ultimately grew it up to about 1300 kids. These kids, you know, get two meals a day to try to keep them in whatever family situation they're in. Sometimes aunts, uncles, grandparents, sometimes a parent or two, but they stay in their family situation instead of becoming orphans. And then they get a world-class education. And so far, I want to say we're five or six classes in of eighth graders that have graduated out of that school. And the countrywide pass rate is like 60%. And we've got a hundred percent of our kids that have graduated eighth grade with a passing rate in the eighth grade exit exam. So it's an amazing program. So what we were really kind of struck by, by the way, on one of these trips, we met the kid who became the third Klein kid, right? We met him in one of the public orphanages in Addis. And so he joined us about five years ago and uh, he's an amazing kid as well. And now we've renamed them Eeny, Meeny and Miney because there ain't going to be no mo, uh, <laughs> no mo. So, um, so I, you know, it's, 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 I love, I love him to death, but like, there's no mo. So, so we, we, we are, I'm telling you, they're amazing kids, but no mo. So I, we, we, uh, this leads us to be thinking about, you know, okay, well, what happens to these kids after eighth grade? You know, not to say that we've solved everything before eighth grade with this school project. We love the school project we're involved in, but like what happens to these kids after eighth grade? And so basically like you're going to maybe go on university track. That's like, call it the top 5% of kids in the country, which by the way, in Ethiopia, I mean, not trying to knock the country, but like they have the worst student loan program ever. Okay. Like university is free. You just pay a huge percentage of your income for the next 30 years to the government to pay for your free tuition. Okay. Okay. Like worst student loan program ever, but Hey, you know, like at least they've got universities and they're growing and, and, and growing, you know, the skill set of their population as best they can. But for the vast, you know, the bottom 95% of those kids, Mm-hmm. their option is really kind of trade school, vocational school, right? And the question is, for many of them, they can't afford the tuition to go to vocational school. That is not tuition free. They've got to pay for that. And for particularly for orphans and vulnerable kids, like they don't have the money to do that. And so we're sitting there going, maybe we need to create a vocational school that like is paired with some life mentoring to like help them figure things out and we'll we'll raise the money and we'll have a, a tuition free vocational school. And then I'm sitting there going, that is like the opposite of sustainable, right? Like we're going to be running around begging people for donations to try to keep a vocational school impacting 30 kids a year alive. 
Okay. Like that doesn't sound like a scalable, sustainable model. And so the idea struck us and what we've built is kind of crazy. It's it's in the early stages, but Hope Takes Root is about creating this vocational school hiding in plain sight as a for-profit business. So what we did is we raised the capital into a U.S. 501c3. We invested the capital into starting this for-profit company in Ethiopia. Okay. We are committed to to putting about 20% of the revenue or more. We're trying to figure out what's sustainable into hiring student workers. These student workers do not have skills. They would not be people who are typically hired. Okay. But we're going to pay them to become student workers and effectively learn everything from sales to customer service, to technical support, to coding and learning how to help build the product. They're building marketing automation tools for Ethiopian shopkeepers and small businesses. Right. And so they're going to learn all of this. We've got four student workers in the program already, Mm -hmm. very early days. We're hoping to scale that up and grow it. And then the plan is the three shareholders, I'm one of them who own this company in Ethiopia, have all committed that every dime of profit distribution we might ever take from that company will be donated back into the US 501c3 so that we can go back and replicate the program somewhere else. Right. So it's it's a really cool cycle where we're going to use capitalism to just pull people out of poverty and create this engine that uh, I hope makes a huge impact in Ethiopia first, but like probably a lot of other countries in the future. That's awesome, man. It's uh, as I started it off, I think it's always great to see people who use their time and their wealth to better other people. But what I'll say now is in addition to that, it's always good to see how someone recognizes a problem and then actually does something about it. So I don't mean to be patronizing by any means, but good job, dude. That's freaking awesome. Well, thank you. No, I, I really appreciate that. And what's really cool is that our executive director for Hope Takes Root and the director of operations for this business in Ethiopia are actually going to be at Summit. Oh, cool. Uh, so you'll get to meet them at, at the Fearless Investing Summit. You know, we've we've done uh, some of the fundraising for this project at Summit every year. We've done like, you know, casino night. And instead of buying chips, you make donations to the, to the charity. We've done a couple different things where we've raised money, you know, for Hope Takes Root as a part of Summit. And so we're going to do that again this year. We're really excited about it. And we're going to have them on stage to kind of talk about how it's going because, hey, we've got employees in Ethiopia, student workers in Ethiopia. It's starting to make an impact and starting they're starting to ship their product. And uh, it's really exciting to see. Love it. I'll make sure to bring my wallet to the event and, and whip it out with a big <laughs> awesome. smile on my face. So with that, that's great. Uh, Aaron, this was fantastic. This is my last meeting yes. of the day before I hop on a plane to go back home for the weekend. So it's a great way to, to end the day. And I look forward to meeting you in person here in a few months. Looking forward to it, David. Thanks. All right. Take care.